Section 15 of The Fables of Bidpa. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Molehill Mountain. The Fables of Bidpa by Anonymous, translated by Abdullah ibn al Mafaka and Joseph Harris. Fable 7 The Fox and the Hen. There was once, continued Damna, a certain fox, who eagerly searching about for something to appease his hunger, at length spied a hen that was busy searching the earth and picking up worms at the foot of a tree. Upon the same tree there also hung a drum, which made a noise every now and then, the branches being moved by the violence of the wind and beating upon it. The fox was just going to fling himself upon the hen and make amends for a long fast, when he heard the noise of the drum. Oh, ho quoth he, looking up, are you there? I will be with ye by and by, that body, whatever it be, I promise myself must certainly have more flesh upon it than a sorry hen. So saying, he clambered up the tree, and in the meanwhile the hen made her escape. The greedy and famished fox seized his prey, and fell to work with teeth and claws upon it. But when he had torn off the head of the drum, and found there was nothing within but an empty cavity, air instead of flesh and gristles, and a mere hollowness instead of good guts and garbage, fetching a deep sigh. "'Unfortunate wretch that I am!' cried he. "'What a delicate morsel I have lost, only for the show of a large bellyful!' "'I have recited this example,' concluded he, "'to the end your majesty may not be terrified with the sound of the bellowing noise you hear, because loud and strenuous.' for there is no certainty from that of its coming from a terrible beast, and, if you please, I will go and see what sort of creature it is, to which the lion consented. Nevertheless, when Domna was gone, he repented his having sent him. For, said the monarch to himself, I should remember my father's excellent rule, that it is a great error in a prince to discover his secrets to any, but especially that there are ten sorts of people who are never to be trusted with them. These are, one, those whom he has used ill without a cause, two, those who have lost their estates or their honor at court, three, those who have been degraded from their employments without any hopes of ever being restored to them again, four, those that love nothing but sedition and disturbance, five, those who see their kindred or acquaintance in preferments from whence themselves have been excluded, six, such as have committed any crime, have been more severely punished than others who have transgressed in the same manner, seven, such as have done good service and have been but ill rewarded for it, eight, enemies reconciled by constraint, nine, those who believe the ruin of the prince will turn to their advantage, ten, and lastly, those who believe themselves less obliged to their sovereign than to his enemy. As these are together so numerous a class of persons, I hope I have not done imprudently in discovering my secrets to Domna. While the king was making these reflections to himself, Domna returned and told him, with a smiling countenance, that the beast which made such a noise was no other than an ox that was feeding in a meadow without any other design than to spend his days lazily in eating and sleeping. And, added Domna, if your majesty thinks it convenient, I will so order the matter, that he shall be glad to come and enroll himself in the number of your servants. The lion was extremely pleased with Domna's proposals, and made him a sign to go and fetch the ox into his presence. On this, Domna went immediately to Cohotorbe, and asked him from whence he came, and what accident had brought him into those quarters. In answer to which, when Cohotorbe had related his history at large, Domna said, Friend, I am very glad I have happened to see thee, for it may be in my power to do thee a singular service by acquainting thee with the state of the place thou hast accidentally wandered into. Know, then, that here lives a lion not far off, who is the king of all the beasts of this country, and that he is, though a terrible enemy, yet a most kind and tender friend to all the beasts who put themselves under his protection. When I first saw you here, I acquainted his majesty with it, and he has graciously desired to see thee, and given me orders to conduct thee into his palace. If thou wilt follow me, I promise thee the favor of being admitted into his service and protection. But if thou refusest to go along with me, know that thou hast not many days to live in this place. So soon as the ox but heard the word lion pronounced, 
He trembled for fear, but, recovering himself a little as Domna continued his speech, he at length made answer, "'If thou wilt assure me that he shall do me no harm, I will follow him.' Domna, on this, immediately swore to him, and Coho Torbe, upon the faith of his oaths, consented to go and wait upon the lion. Domna, on this, ran before to give the king notice of Coho Torbe's coming, and our ox, arriving soon after, made a profound reverence to the king, who received him with great kindness, and asked him what occasion had brought him into his dominions. In answer to which, when the ox had recounted to him all his adventures, "'Remain here,' said the lion, "'with us, and live in peace, for I permit all my subjects to live within my dominions in repose and tranquillity.' The ox, having returned his majesty's thanks for his kind reception, promised to serve him with a real fidelity, and at length insinuated himself in such a manner into the lion's favour that he gained his majesty's confidence and became his most intimate favourite. This, however, was matter of great affliction to poor Domna, who, when he saw that Coho Torbe was in greater esteem at court than himself, and that he was the only depository of the king's secrets, it wrought him in so desperate a jealousy that he could not rest, but was ready to hang himself for vexation. In the fullness of his heart he flew to make his moan to Kalila. "'Oh, dear wife,' said he, "'I have taken a world of care and pains to gain the king's favour, and all to no purpose. I brought, you may remember, into his presence the object that occasioned all his disturbances, and that very ox is now become the sole cause of my disquiet.' To which Kalila answered, "'Spouse, you ought not complain of what you have done, or at least you have nobody to blame but yourself.' "'It is true,' said Domna, "'that I am the cause of all my troubles. This I am too sensible of, but what I desire of you is to prescribe me the remedy.' "'I told you from the beginning,' replied Kalila, "'that for my part I would never meddle with your affairs, and now do not intend to trouble myself with the care of your disturbances.' Mind your own business yourself, and consider what course you have to take, and take it. For, as to me, I have plagues enough of my own, without making myself unhappy about the misfortunes which your follies have brought upon you. Well then, replied Domna, what I shall do is this. I will use all my endeavors to ruin this ox which occasions me all my misery, and shall be contented if I but find I have as much wit as the sparrow that revenged himself upon the hawk. Kalila, upon this, desired him to recite that fable, and Domna gave it to her in the following manner. End of section 15